Welcome back. My name is Steve Miller. I'm a professor at Williams College, and we are continuing to teach us as scholars lectures on photography and RSA, and we're now shifting to fast multiplication. So earlier we talked about factoring numbers. And so in some sense, factoring is trivial. You just give me a number, and I just try all the numbers less than that and see, does any of them divide? So I can factor very, very easily, but I can't factor quickly. And the amount of time it takes to try all these numbers is so high that it's essentially impractical and we need a better way. And to date, no one knows a really good way to factor a general number. And because of that, a lot of encryption schemes are based on the difficulty of factoring. Or more generally, a lot of problems that are hard to do become the source of a way to encrypt information. And the idea is, unless you have a secret key, it's going to be hard to undo. So if I know that n is a product of two primes, p and q, and I know one of the primes, it's not hard to figure out the second, right? I can divide very easily. We have a process that's easy to do one way. Multiplying numbers is easy. We don't know how to factor. We don't know how to go the other direction easily. So let's talk about the cost of some things we always do. And so in my mind, I'm always looking at huge numbers. Think 100 digits, 1,000 digits. Multiplication is far more expensive than addition. If you have 200 digit numbers and you want to add them, then it's on the order of 100 additions that you have to do digit by digit. Maybe you have to carry, so maybe it's on the order of maybe 200 additions, but it's still not that bad. If you have to multiply 200 digit numbers, then each digit of the second number multiplies each digit of the first, so it's 100 squared operations. So with large numbers, multiplication is far more expensive than addition. So when I'm trying to consider the cost of things, I don't really look at the cost of addition. I assume addition is basically free. I really worry about the multiplications. And there's a lot of things like that in life where what really matters is one aspect of it. The other part is so small, don't really be worried about it. It's drowned out by a lot of the other stuff. Uh, when you look at the cost of college tuition and then you look at maybe the student activity fee, maybe it's a little high, but you know, it's you know, 60,000, 70,000, whatever, for a you know, year of tuition. They could just easily bundle that in. So let's take a polynomial of degree five, three x to the fifth minus eight x to the fourth and so on. So how many multiplications? Well, to calculate x to the fifth, x times x is x squared, that's one multiplication, times x is x cubed is two multiplications, times x is x uh, to the fourth is three multiplications, times x is x to the fifth is four multiplications, times three is five multiplications. So three x to the fifth costs five multiplications, 8x to the fourth costs four multiplications, and so on and so on and so on. So I have 15 multiplications. And these are very famous numbers. These are the triangle numbers. So if you add the numbers from 0 to d, it's just d, d plus 1 over 2. One of the ways to see this, uh, and you might have heard the story of Gauss finding this out, discovering this when he was five years old. The fun version of the story I heard is his teacher was having a bad day. You know, this is almost really apocryphal and wanted to shut the little tykes up and told all the kids to add the numbers from one to a hundred, expecting that that would occupy them for a while and he would have some time to just mentally recoup. And then Gauss immediately says 5,050. And what Gauss did is he took the numbers, one to D, and then he added them in reverse order. One plus D is always D plus one. Two plus D minus one is D plus one. All the way down to D plus one is D plus one. So by writing them backwards, each sum is always d plus 1. So we get twice s of d is d times d plus 1, because we have d sums of size d plus 1. So the sum we care about is just d, d plus 1 over 2, which is the claim. So what this tells you is that as the degree of the polynomial grows, the cost is growing quadratically. If I have a polynomial of degree uh, 10, it would be 10 times 11 over 2, or 55, which is a bit more than 15. If I had a polynomial of degree 100, 
it would be 100 times 101 over 2. That would be about um, 5,000. So it's growing very rapidly. Here is Horner's algorithm. So I've used a bunch of colors to illustrate. It's one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen in mathematics. It takes something you've done all of your life and shows you there is a better way of doing this. And if you want to talk about general principles to give to students, there's opportunities to fix inefficiencies all around us. Just because we've done something one way doesn't mean we should always do it. Uh, you could even talk to them about the keyboard. So why do we have a QWERTY keyboard? Why does it start Q-W-E-R-T-Y? Anybody know why we have a QWERTY keyboard? I tell my students it's because we don't love you. In the old days when you had typewriters, if you had two keys that were close to each other on the typewriter in quick succession, when they went down to strike the paper, they would often lock. This keyboard was deliberately designed to slow typing down, to make you alternate between hands. Professional typists use a Dvorak keyboard, which is much better. But we are so used to this keyboard that it's hard for us to change. And so the next generation also learns this keyboard and it sadly keeps propagating. But it's worthwhile to just stop and think, where did it come from? Why would people choose to put the keys in the order Q-W-E-R-T-Y? What was the, you know, there's usually a reason for it. And sadly, what used to be a good reason may not be a good reason now. The other thing I often mention to the students is what does CC stand for in an email? Anybody know what CC stands for in an email? Carbon copy. Carbon copy. This goes to the old days with carbon papers. You might still see them at some tourist places where you would write down and you would get a second copy underneath. Well, in the electronic era, we're not really doing carbon copies. But the name has stuck. Some people have redefined CC to stand for courtesy copy, not carbon copy, to just keep the CC alive, but have a name that makes more sense. So how does Horner's algorithm work? It all works by grouping. And so what I do is I look at 3x minus 8, multiply by x, add 7, multiply by x, add 6, multiply by x, subtract 9, multiply by x, and add 2. Let's see what happens to the 3x. 3x times x is x squared, times x is x cubed, times x is x to the fourth, times x is x to the fifth, 3x to the fifth minus 8x, minus 8x squared, minus 8x cubed, minus 8x to the fourth. And you can see as you go through this, you get exactly the same function you started with. But what we were really doing before was wasteful. We calculated x squared, and then we calculated x cubed from scratch. It's like, well, we already know what x squared is. Why would we calculate x cubed from scratch? Just take the value from x squared, save that as you're doing your calculation, and build up like this. Now, when we look at it, how many multiplications? One, two, three, four, five. There's only five multiplications. The number of additions hasn't changed, but we've gone from 15 multiplications to five multiplications. So the cost is now order D. So the cost, instead of being D squared over two, roughly, you know, the degree of the polynomial, it's degree D. So if I have something of size 100, D squared over two is about 5,000. This is much better. Unfortunately, it's not good enough. We are going to want to deal with polynomials of size 10, of degree 10 to the 200 or 10 to the 400. If I take the square root of 10 to the 200 or 10 to the 400, it's still a huge number. So unfortunately, this is not enough to work. But this illustrates another wonderful math principle. What we are trying to do here is we are trying to come up with a way to evaluate any polynomial. And the first way we do, the way we teach in school, is just plug in. So if you want to find what is f of 2, just plug in 2 for x everywhere, and then combine. And that will work, and that works for all polynomials. Horner's algorithm also works for all polynomials, and it's much faster. 
we can't really do better for all polynomials, but maybe there's a special class of polynomials that are very simple and easy to work with. And maybe for those polynomials, we can do even better than this. So again, if we need to do something to the 10 to the 200 times, we can't do it. So can anybody give me a degree five polynomial that might be easier to work with than this one? What's the easiest degree five polynomial you can think of? X to the fifth. Excellent, X to the fifth. And so we want to try special polynomials. And maybe for a special polynomial, we can do better. Let's do x to the n. So I always do n equals 100. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to write 100 in binary. So rather than writing things in decimal, you know, 1, 10, 100, 1,000, it's 1, 2, 4, 8, 16. Is everybody familiar and comfortable with binary? And so what I'm doing here is this means I have zero ones, I have zero twos, I have one four, I have no eights, I have no sixteens, I have one thirty second, I have one sixty fourth. So it's very similar to writing things in base 10. We put the subscript two to remind us that we're now doing things in binary, not in base 10. And now the powers are just not one, 10, 100, but 1, 2, 4, 8. In base 10, the coefficients could be 0 through 9. It's one less than the base. So in base 2, it's really nice. The only possibilities for the coefficients are just 0 or 1. And so with a little bit of work, you see 164 plus 32 plus 4. So naively, if I were to use Horner's algorithm or anything to calculate x to the 100, how many multiplications would it take to calculate x to the 100? So if I wanted to do x to the 100, how many multiplications would that be? Well, from what we've seen before, if it's a polynomial of degree d, it's basically d multiplication. And the reason it was d was because we could have a coefficient in front of x. Since I just have the pure polynomial x to the 100, it's going to be 99 multiplications. Here's how to do it in much less. x times x is x squared. x squared times x squared is x to the fourth. x to the fourth times x to the fourth is x to the eighth, and so on. I can write x to the 100 as x to the 64 times x to the 32 times x to the fourth. So I would need my x to the 64. I would need my x to the 32, and I would need my x to the 4. And if I multiply those three together, I would get x to the 100. How many multiplications does this cost? It costs me 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 multiplications to get this table, and then 7 multiplications to multiply x to the 64 by x to the 32, and then 8 to multiply by x to the 4. So we see that the number of multiplications is much less than 99, we actually can do it in eight. And what's really going on is the number of multiplications we need is really twice the log of m, base two. And this is why RSA works. This is why we can do mathematics like this, because we don't have to do something of order 10 to the 200. We can't do that many multiplications. But log of 10 to the 200, that's not so bad. The log of 10 to the 200 base 2 is 200 log of 10 base 2. The log of 10 base 2 is less than 4 because 2 to the 4 is 16. So this would be less than 800 multiplications. We can do something on the order of 800 multiplications. If you want to think about how much does this cost, you know, are you doing disk storage, there are some games you can do to minimize storage. This can be implemented without too much trouble at all. And so again, just to recap, Horner's algorithm takes us from order d squared to order d, and then fast multiplication takes us down to order log of d base 2. And this is one of the big things in applied mathematics. It's not enough to be able to do something. You have to be able to do something efficiently. If it takes too long, if the universe is going to die, if you need every subatomic particle of the universe to be a universe itself, 
of supercomputers devoted exclusively to you, you're out of luck. So I'm gonna stop this part over here and then move to the next unit. So I'll log on in a moment.